Let's talk about Alstroemeria or the Peruvian lily. In the uh, lore of the flowers, that Alstroemeria is is, uh, is said to symbolize friendship, devotion, and it's got a lot of twists in the flowers. So it's supposed to s symbolize the trials and tribulations of those friendships. Now it was uh, it's 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 a pretty important cut flower in all the markets. It's it's a standard on the Dutch and international trade. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, Alstroemeria grown in the United States, actually quite a bit, but uh, most of uh, what's grown outside of uh, other countries, outside of Central America and Africa, it's there's about 272 acres of production uh, in Holland, and the rest of the world has just under a thousand acres, and even though you see Alstroemeria in all the markets on a regular basis, it's still considered to be somewhat of a new product. Um, new, I don't know what the books mean by new, other than maybe in the last 50 years. Um, and it has a very long shelf life and a very long base life with its flowers. Lots of different flower colors, lots of breeding work uh, on different flower colors, different flower qualities and such as that. In the United States, um, the data I have is, is quite old, but it's, it's still pretty much the same, if not uh, down a little bit. Uh, 25 million stems grown uh, in 2000. Um, at that point, 9% was grown in Colorado. Uh, today, it's very virtually 1% or less that's grown in Colorado. Uh, 2001. Um, 21 million stems. This is one of, the, one of those ones that's dropping slowly um, and so forth. Uh, again, most of the production of Alstroemeria that's grown um, in the country is uh, grown in California. Um, it uh, has a, 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 a small hold, continues to have a small hold in Colorado. It's not 9.2 percent, but it, it um, it um, still a respectable crop in the United States. Alstroemeria is in the Liliaceae family. It's native to South America and the Andes Mountains. They call it the Peruvian lily. You'll see it growing wild on the uh, roadsides, uh, driving through the mountains um, in Colombia. Um, native to the highland forest. It doesn't look much like what we look today. Actually, th what you see growing in the wild is closer to the Alstrom area that you see now uh, growing as, that they're selling as a potted plant or as a bedding plant. There are shorter varieties now that you'll see in the industry. That's more like what it looks like in the, the native uh, country. Uh, the uh, breeders are looking for vigorous growth and looking for year-round flowering and looking for uh, new colors, of course. Now, Alstroemeria, the breeders have a pretty tight control over um, their product. And most cultivars, almost all modern cultivars of Alstroemeria are protected by plant patents, international plant patents. And you don't actually, when you buy rhizomes, you're not actually buying the rhizome, you're leasing the rhizome you're leasing the right to use that rhizome and grow a plant from it. Kind of a different uh, perspective. And you're paying your royalties on an annual basis and your uh, royalties are assessed on your yearly production. And a rhizome division can cost as much as $7 per rhizome. That's just a little bitty plant part. And you were talking earlier about a $50 plant. Well, this is a $7 piece of rhizome, piece of plant material. And that's um, the way it works. Now, they have pretty high productivity, uh, so you're going to be able to recover your, your investment fairly quickly. But this, again, doesn't include the royalties. And when you buy from a uh, broker, that broker comes to your operation several times a year and observes their property to see what kind of production you're getting, so make sure that you're paying the proper royalty. So here's a picture of a rhizome. Um, it um, develops on vertical shoots. Uh, lateral rhizomes produce more vertical shoots. 
and um, above the shoot, like all the plant material, all the uh, above the soil level, the shoots don't generate lateral stems, so all the shoots arise from the rhizome. And uh, here's a drawing from one of the websites um, where you can see this is this is the part of the material that you're going to buy, and um, the rhizome breaks off into uh, several different breaks. Um, and those of you can read Dutch. So they're planted in the ground. Uh, this is a picture of an operation in uh, Costa Rica, actually. Um, young plants are uh, grown from tissue culture or plant divisions, mostly tissue culture, uh, to get a high quality plant material. Uh, ra planted in raised beds, four to 48 inches wide. And depending on the cultivar, how vigorous they grow, uh, they're usually spaced 13 to 16 inches apart. So that little piece of stem, we're, we're putting them quite a ways apart because they grow pretty vigorously and pretty big. And then it needs to have flower netting applied as well. And here's a, a, a production uh, field in Colombia where you can see that they've already got the, the netting down and they're going to raise that netting up as the plants grow because you can't push netting on top of an alstom area. And the stems require support to, uh, for in the wind. Here's a, uh, some alstom area that's being uh, planted in a box, in bulb boxes. And here you can see they're coming up um, this way. Growing in bulb crates or bulb boxes is very efficient because you can get it on the ground clean soil, clean sterilized soil, and you can move it out really quickly for another crop. One of the challenges with Alstroemeria is staying up to date with the colors because this is one crop that the colors change frequently and quickly. So here's a uh, uh, pictures of uh, Alstroemeria production in Holland. Um, here, the lily stem is close to being harvested. Again, this is one that we don't cut, but we pull. And just more production pictures. Now, like I said, we're going to plant them in ground beds or raised beds, six to eight inches deep. Uh, we're going to keep them in the bed for three to four years before we cycle them out. So you're going to plant probably 25% of your alstomeria production with refreshed cuttings, refreshed rhizomes every year, every 25% every year, so you can maintain a better uh, access to the modern uh, materials that, the, that the, your, the florists are looking for. In the northern hemisphere, we plant them uh, November to June, and uh, southern hemisphere September to December, off season. pH is fairly a little on the high, 6.4 to 7. 100% organic matter is typical, the typical mix, 100% uh, peat moss, 100% core. It's got to be well drained because the rhizome is going to grow downward. Most people think a rhizome is growing laterally. This one grows downward. And we replant every couple of years. And this is a Alstom area production house uh, in Colorado. And uh, you can see it's got the raised wooden frame on the side with uh, one, two, three, four layers of um, plant support. So planting layout is based upon how many plants per square foot um, that you're going to plant. So depending on how long, and, and what this really refers to is how long you leave the plants in the bed. If you're going to leave the plants past four years, some, some growers will go past three to four years, you want to plant uh, fewer plants uh, per square foot with a bigger spacing, but if you're going to cycle that crop faster, you're going to plant more with more density because the plants do uh, grow fairly quickly. We use uh, a perimeter irrigation system for um, Alstroemeria uh, or with trickle tube. We 
don't use overhead irrigation because it doesn't penetrate the canopy effectively and we, ha we don't want to have any water on the foliage. Uh, it's fairly pest and disease free, but we do need to monitor it. So this is called a gates system and where we just have a perimeter of, um, of poly pipe where we just put the emitters in to the s that way. And in uh, areas where the greenhouses are very hot, they typically use both to make sure they get adequate moisture. So here's um, a greenhouse where uh, you can see the ulcer area in the backside. This is a newly planted bed, and they've already laid down the irrigation tubing for that particular crop. And you see my shadow taking the picture. Now since we're leaving a crop in the ground for several years, you want to make sure your soil structure is, is uh, adequate before you plant. Uh, we typically add ammonium nitrate, calcium nitrate, and potassium nitrate. Um, we uh, inject with every ir irrigation. This is a constant feed. It's a balanced system. One to two decisiemens per meter, which is a pretty heavy feed. Uh, just pretty generic, almost anything works. Um, of course, when they're really transpiring, we use a lower electrical conductivity. We start to fertilize the minute we see root development, because the minute you have root development, root activity, the plants are able to take up the fertilizer. And uh, we're going to jump up the fertilizer after we see shoot development, just so they don't get hungry. Um, like most crops, uh, cool soil temperatures, um, ammonium nitrate, uh, ammonium is going to give us any kind of ammonium in the system is going to give us poor growth development. Uh, anywhere from one to one to one to four nitrogen potassium. And this is a complicated crop with soil with root zone temperatures in that if it's cold, You'll see yet leaf yellowing, cold soils lead to leaf yellowing, yellowing primarily looking at um, iron deficiency. And with the cold soil and loss of iron, uh, you'll see active roots uh, start to fall back. And of course, if you over irrigate or the water stays in the soil, if it's not freely draining, that's going to cause the same problems as cold soil. Now, from planting to um, the first six weeks of crop, our night temperature is fairly cold, 55. The day temperature, 57 to 61. We're trying to push most of our root development, not a lot of shoot development, when you plant the rhizome. Um, you can go with lower temperatures, but it'll give you a slower start, but a, a higher quality material. Uh, shorter stems, but the flowers be um, have longer vase life and more vibrant in their color. Summer production, uh, 63 to 68 is the best uh, temperature at night. Um, so that means we're going to be cooling our greenhouse at night and we're going to keep our soil cool and cool nights. And of course, in sh where it's a lot of sun, we're going to have to do a lot of uh, shading. So a lot of this is nor in California, a lot of this production is Northern California. So. Late autumn to winter, uh, 50 to 57 is the ideal. Cooler temperatures, again, reduces development and yield in the autumn production. A lot of growers, especially in Holland and in northern latitudes, also use artificial light. February through March, uh, warmer, 55 to 59. This is one of those crops where you're looking at the calendar always and, and monkeying with your thermostat. Now, flowering in an Ulster Mary is controlled by the rhizome, and it's temperature dependent. And it gets somewhat complicated. Because the shoot development all happens underground. Remember, we're not getting any lateral breaks on our above ground stems. So everything is coming from the ground, coming from the rhizome. High root zone temperatures, warm soil, reduces flower induction. 
Now that's flower induction. So the optimum conditions for flowering for the first six weeks is keeping the soil temperature at 41 degrees Fahrenheit. 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Now this is kind of different from what we've seen before. This is actually vernalization. And then we force it, after we get flower development, after the first six weeks, we jump it to 55. If we let the soil temperature get above 70, the rhizomes will devernalize. And we'll talk a little bit more about vernalization. We talk about Easter lilies and spend some time on that. But vernalization is the use of temperature, primarily cold temperature, to change it from a vegetative meristem to a reproductive meristem. So what growers will do is they'll keep the soil surface cool with mulch or they'll cool it artificially with pipes that are buried in the soil that they'll take and pass cold, chilled water through them. So we're chilling the beds. Ideal humidity fairly high, 70 to 80 percent. Alstomeri is not prone to botrytis infections. We're lucky there because it makes a little more humidity, so it's not going to have a lot of botrytis. Um, however, if we keep it below 90, it's going to give us a stronger, more stout stem. And um, when it's really hot and the plants are transpiring a lot, if they're not getting enough moisture through the system, if they any water stress at all, the leaves will scorch, okay, if, if it's really hot. So what we'll do is we'll use HAF fans to move the air in the greenhouse so the humidity at the, it does is reduces the boundary layer so we can get better transpiration to the plant to keep the foliage cool. Um, I've seen some growers use sprinklers, but that usually damages the flower. Um, supplemental lighting um, will haste speed fly flowering in low light areas. It'll speed it up. Uh, 600 foot candles is about what they use. Um, <coughs> gives us flat faster flowering 12 weeks earlier, 30% more flowers. This is not a facultative or obligate flowering response like we would see with other crops, but just more photosynthesis. And of course, shading. So here's a picture of a greenhouse with HID uh, lamps. And this is, they're actually using um, sodium vapor lamps. And you can see the, the yellow cast in this picture is not picture is not the color of the foliage, but it's the color of the foliage under the HID lighting, okay? So that's kind of an artificial cast in the color. Carbon dioxide um, will increase, the uh, injection will increase the flower quality, give you a, a little bump in production, especially during the winter months. They so use 600 to 800 uh, parts per million. Um, summer production, 350 to 400, that's uh, atmospheric um, CO2. So they only injecting CO2 typically when they're adding lights and when the um, temperature is uh, cooler. Anything greater than 1,000, like you'd see with carnations, it's, you're wasting your money. It's typically between 600 to 800 parts per million. All right. Here are some videos that I snagged off the internet somewhere years ago. This is um, Alstermeria coming out of the ground after about four days. And um, you notice they've got a coat of perlite on the top of the bed, that perlite serves to um, give it a little bit better production in the, protection in the soil. Here we'll see Alstomeri stem grows through the flower netting itself. We 
These are time-lapse photographs, obviously. And the next one, I call this dancing alstroemeria. And here we should see the plants, flowers opening up. That's also a good example of watching the shadow of the, of the purlins going across the crop. Harvesting, we pull the stem from the ground. We don't uh, cut them, we pull them. And it's, it's a lot less work. And if we cut them, uh, cutting is only done on cultivars where you, you might pull the rhizome out of the ground or damage the rhizome, but most people just go in there and just pull the, the stem straight up. Uh, this is done usually twice per week um, in uh, northern latitudes, down in, southern la uh, down in the equator, in the mountain production, they'll do this uh, three to four times. Uh, if you have blind shoots, it's one of the things that the growers will typically do is they'll send their labor through the greenhouse on a regular basis to pull blind shoots. Blind shoots are those that don't have blooms on them uh, because that's just really cutting back on the quality of the plant. And if it's got more than 30 leaves on it already, it's, it's typically blind. Uh, are the growers going in there and counting 30 leaves on each plant? No, they pretty much already know how much there is. And that's uh, what they're doing. They're pulling the blind shoots is actually a, an action of thinning because we don't disbud these because uh, it's uh, part of the, the flowers are coming on the end of the stems. Uh, thinning is the most labor intensive part of the production because we want to increase the penetration into the canopy. Uh, more light into the canopy gives us a shorter, a more compact, stronger, sturdier stem. Uh, thinning also encourages uh, more rhizome branching because remember, all of the foliage, all of the stems are coming from the rhizome. And they'll also use thinning to stagger their production. So the goal is to have that you're harvesting uh, plants, harvesting blooms every week for continuous production. And of course, when the light levels are low, we're going to thin more regularly to keep good light quality into the lower part of the canopy. And until flowering starts, that's about uh, we're re removing about 10, 15 to 25 percent, 15 to 25 percent of our stems on a regular basis until we get flowering so we have good development. Remember, the photosynthates from the foliage got to go into the rhizome. The rhizome's got to grow. It's the rhizome that generates the new stems. And we're doing that weekly. Okay, one of the major producers of um, Alstermeria, one of the major, major breeders of Alstermeria is a company called Konst, and they have some YouTube videos posted, and I thought we would watch those videos as part of class today. Netherlands. The audio is just tacky music. I think it's just tacky music. <laughs> it's 
with the lights off? Would it be better? So I get a catalog every year from Con. Co I got two umlauts over the O. Who knows how to speak Dutch? Is that Konst or Konst? Hmm? Kunst. Kunst. Thank you. So here, what they're doing is one of the things that they do when they take it from tissue culture to expand the uh, rhizome production up is they'll take these outside. And you can see they're planting it, planting it almost 100% um, sphagnum moss. You go to greenhouses in, in northern Europe, you see lots of conveyors. Now, in Europe, they're going to be delivering um, uh, plant material in soil. In the United States, the plant ma material that comes to the United States comes as a rhizome. Um, there are certain crops that are coming out of Holland have been uh, granted um, waivers with quarantine 37, but I don't think Alstroemeria is one of them. I know it's crooked. There he goes. But you see the rhizomes are being dug. They grow them for a couple fields to get them up in size. For controlling bloom. We used to do some alstroemeria research at Perk uh, when I first got here, uh, and we put the soil cool. We actually had a um, a rig that uh, where we had the soil res water reservoir inside of a freezer, and we put pumped the water through the freezer to chill the soil. Matthew, you think m my stuff is scary? You should have seen what I s walked into when I got here. Yeah, hmm. Greenhouse people are pretty innovative in making things work. I still didn't hear you. Well, it's a lily, so.
What book is that? Got your plant collection done yet? My wife, my wa I, as soon as I get down with class today, my wife wants me to take her brother, my brother-in-law, up to uh, Estes Park to listen to the Elk Bugle tonight. So. Have you done that? Huh? <laughs> it's fun. It's it's really cool. It's very surreal. All I have to do is you can just. Go up uh, into Estes Park, go into the park a little ways and park on the side of the road and watch the elk. The big boys keep their harems together and, and bugle at each other. Hmm? Not an umble. That's, that's the, that's the uh, 